All I want for Christmas is for you to subscribe and click the notification bell. Only a few more days until Christmas 2018, and that means spending time with family, giving and receiving gifts, and of course, experiencing something terrifying. Will you make it through this Christmas? Well, have these 10 allegedly true scary Christmas stories to help you endure the holidays. If you want your stories featured on this show, you can share them with us at darknessprevails.org. Be sure to check out and review my podcast with the links below as well. Also, subscribe to my friend Swamp Dweller with the link in the description for helping me finish this video with the last story because I bit my tongue and I had a lot of trouble reading everything here. So yeah, thanks Swamp Dweller. Christmas Close Encounter from Miller. Location, Washington, D.C. This took place last year. I work overnight for an IT company in Washington, D.C. I commute to D.C. from a small place between Fairfax County and Loudoun County, Virginia, called Stone Ridge. It's a pretty easy 45-minute commute. I had recently found out the weekend before that I would be working Christmas Eve with just myself and one other guy. Needless to say, my wife was not happy about this. So the week goes by and it's finally time for me to go to work. At the time, we were in the middle of a windstorm that had blown siding and shingles off our roof and a few other homes nearby. Before leaving, my wife asked me to take the Christmas wreath off the door so that it wouldn't get blown away or damaged. So I opened the door and I placed the wreath on the floor a few feet away from the entrance, then closed and locked it, then went to work. Our work that night was pretty easy, with only a few calls asking us to reset passwords and account lockouts. Around 2 a.m., my wife calls. She's freaking out, demanding that I come home right away. I'm trying to get her to calm down to tell me what happened, and she explained. She had been upstairs asleep with our one-year-old son when she heard a loud bang downstairs followed by the cat running down and starting to mule loudly. My wife got up to grab him, thinking he was thirsty, as he had a bad habit of drinking from any water faucets around the house. When she got downstairs, she found that our front door had been forced and broken open, and what she could only describe as something like a large dog or bear standing on two legs in the front doorway, with the cat hissing and keeping it at bay. She quickly grabbed the cat and ran back up the stairs, not even stopping to look back. She locked herself in the bedroom with our son and the cat, locking the door behind them. After my wife told me this, I told her that I was on my way home right away, that she should call the police right away. Needless to say, I was speeding my entire way home thinking if a cop started chasing me, he could give me a ticket in my driveway. I managed to get home without incident and found four cop cars surrounding the house. I identified myself to the police and went to check on my wife and son and cat, who were thankfully fine, though my wife was incredibly shaken. She told me that after she had hung up with me, she heard what sounded like heavy footsteps walking through the house and the sounds of things being moved. We then went to see if anything had been stolen which everything was still there, thankfully. However, the reef that I had put beside the door had been moved to the living room and placed on my son's toy box. Several of his presents had also been moved from our living room to the kitchen. The police stated that our house was one of five homes to have been broken in that night, and it had been blamed on the wind opening the front door. Although wind wouldn't explain how the reef and presents had been moved, that day, I went to Home Depot and reinforced all the doors and windows. Whatever this animal was, the next time we meet, I'll be behind a 12 gauge and I'll be ready to protect my family. Christmas Eve Stranger from The Goth Mistress 13 Location Unknown 
I've been with my fiance, Austin, for three years. We dated for maybe two months before moving in together, as I was still 17 and in high school. A month before the end of my senior year, he moved in with my parents and I due to a falling out with his brother. Then about four days before my graduation, we got our first house together. It wasn't amazing or beautiful by any means, but it was ours. It wasn't in the best neighborhood, but it was cheap. The roof on the place was really old. The basement leaked and all the windows were busted out. Not to mention the siding along the driveway had been spray painted. But we slowly repaired it and made it much more livable. About six months into living there, that's when the weirdness began to happen. I told myself at first that it was just the house settling, or I was getting spooked because I was in a new place. Some mornings, my clothes that I had laid out on the dresser were in a pile on the floor, or scattered and thrown about the room, and when I'd be home alone, I would hear the floorboards in the hallway creak like someone was walking on them, and it would only happen when I was alone. Multiple times, I thought I would catch something out of the corner of my eye, and when I would turn to look, it would be gone. I never said anything to my fiancé, because I thought he would tell me it's nothing. Until one day, I saw him staring at the dark bedroom from the middle of the hallway, and I called out to him. He jumped and looked at me with fear in his eyes. Where did you just come from? He asked me, his voice a bit shaky. I came inside from the back porch. Why? I just saw you standing in the dark in the bedroom. When I asked you what you were doing, you just stood there and didn't even acknowledge me, he said. Then, when I heard the back door shut, I looked that way. But when I looked back toward the bedroom, you were just gone. I watched him suddenly glance back to the darkened bedroom. Babe, I swear I was outside, I told him. Plus, you know I'm a bit afraid of the dark. I wouldn't just stand in it for no reason. I inched closer to him and hugged him as I said that. When the next horrifying incident happened, it was only a week before Christmas. Now, I'm a very festive person, so there was always some sort of light on in the house, whether that's just one of the house lights or some decorations inside or out. Specifically, I had laid out some lights down the hallway to illuminate the path to the bathroom. One night in particular, I was super exhausted. I had just gotten home from work. I was settling in on the couch to watch some videos on YouTube, but I ended up passing out only a few minutes in. Suddenly, I woke up to a deep silence in the house. I always had some sort of fan or white noise on in the background to relax myself, but for some odd reason, it was now silent in the house, and all the lights had been turned off. I tried to use my phone to illuminate the area, but as I pressed the home button, it showed that my battery was at zero. Great, I thought, realizing the situation I was in. All the clocks in the house were digital, so I didn't even know what time it was, because, again, the electricity seemed to be off. I was too scared to move at this point. It was too dark. Dark enough for something or someone to hide right next to you, and you wouldn't even know it. I stayed still, breathing slowly and trying to listen to any sounds around me. After a few minutes, I began to hear the creak of the basement stairs. Crap, I thought. I don't think I locked the basement door when I made it home. I didn't wait to find out, so I bolted from my bedroom, slamming and locking the door as I heard the basement door suddenly slam open, followed by fast footsteps going down the hallway. I pressed my body against the door and sunk down, gripping my phone to my chest and trying to control my breathing. Whoever it was had gone into the other bedroom first and was now scratching on the door. Shortly after... I heard whoever it was banging around in there. Then it went quiet, but not entirely quiet, because I could hear something creeping over to the door, 
the door I was leaning against. I clapped a hand over my mouth, muffling a cry or scream, when suddenly something banged right against the door. It was scratching and beating against it. It or they knew I was in here. I could hear something in my mind telling me that if I let this thing inside, I would never see my fiancé again. I kept myself pressed to the door for what felt like hours. Finally, I heard that creeping sound again, but it seemed to be walking away, creeping back to the basement. Suddenly, the glow of the hallway lights beneath my door appeared. The lights had come back on. I looked down at my phone, and the bright Apple screen came up. It was powering back on. Its battery was nearly full, and I had a ton of missed calls and messages from my fiancé, wondering why my phone was off and what was going on. It was only 1 a.m. He was still at work closing up. I turned on the flashlight on my phone now, standing up, and carefully opened the door. I was horrified to find there was nothing, absolutely nothing, like it all had gone on in my mind and not in reality. I grabbed my vape, my phone, and a knife from my purse, and I sat outside in the cold until Austin came home. I told him, and he didn't believe me. I was terrified to be in that house alone anymore, but unfortunately that night did not mark the end of my suffering and torment. On Christmas Eve, I waited in my car as long as I deemed it necessary until I had the courage to enter the house. It was completely black inside again, and I was scared. I took my flashlights I had near the door and turned them on facing the kitchen. Three candles were lit and placed on the floor next to me, and I held Austin's air rifle in my hands. With every noise, I would pump the air rifle and mentally dare anything to come out. At about 11.55, I heard something start running around outside the house, banging on the windows and doors. I had intentionally left a door unlocked in the kitchen that led outside, prepared for whatever came for me through it. Suddenly, the back door burst open and a figure raced into the kitchen. I fired the air rifle. The figure tripped and fell on the floor groaning, and only then did I realize it was Austin. He had come home from work early to surprise and scare me. He lay on the floor groaning, cursing me as I helped him up. This time it was him and I was so relieved, but when I asked him about banging on the windows outside, he said that it wasn't him that did it. From now on, I'm determined to be ready for whatever that thing is. Creepy Christmas Burglar from Elise Location, England. It was Christmas Eve of 2012, and it was just a normal yet exciting day for me, only being seven at the time. I lived with my mom, dad, three older sisters and one younger sister, and my dog. We lived in a small town in England, so everyone pretty much knew each other, which sort of makes this story a bit more creepy. So it was Christmas Eve, and me and my family had settled down for a quiet night filled with Christmas movies and candy. You know, the sort of things that make you feel Christmassy. It was around 9pm, and me and my older sister, who was 9 at the time, couldn't sleep out of excitement. Being so young, we were the types of kids who loved Christmas and always wanted to see Santa whenever possible. We stayed up that night giggling and smiling and determined to catch a glimpse of Santa. Time passed and me and my sister were both getting very tired. We were starting to doze off. By then, I couldn't be sure what time it was. I was asleep in my sister's bed when I was suddenly shaken awake by her. I was surprised by this and I was kind of annoyed as I was in a deep sleep already. But my sister shushed me. I asked her what she was doing and she said she had heard someone downstairs. My eyes widened. I was beaming with excitement now, remembering it was now Christmas Day, 
So my seven-year-old self knew it just had to be Santa. When I suggested to my sister that it must be Santa, she also widened her eyes as if to say she agreed. I told her quickly we should go downstairs to see, but my sister insisted that if Santa saw that we were still awake, that he would take back our presents. I was a little annoyed at this, but I reluctantly agreed. So we sat there waiting in suspense to hear him, and sure enough, we heard what appeared to be footsteps coming from downstairs. I got a little shiver of excitement at this, so me and my sister crawled under the covers and quietly laughed in happiness. But that's when things got weird. My oldest two cousins slowly in the dark came into our room with my little sister. Their faces were ghostly pale and told us that we had to go and play hide from Santa in the bathroom, which was attached to our bedroom. I was confused, but again I agreed thinking it was so Santa wouldn't know we were awake. When we got into the bathroom, my sisters went into the airing cupboard, placing quilts into the bath and told us to lay on them and get some sleep. So confused but in a tired state, we proceeded to do so. We woke up in the morning in my parents' bed, which was even more weird. But even weirder, my parents were awake at the edge of the bed. I woke up and exclaimed, Merry Christmas. This made my parents jump. I quickly woke up my sisters and proceeded to nag my parents before they finally took us downstairs to the living room to open our presents. Everything was normal that day and we had a fun time. But a few days ago, I remembered this encounter as Christmas is in a few weeks from writing this, and my mom decided I was old enough now, old enough to know. My mom began to tell me that me and my sister had really heard something else that night. My older sisters were awakened by the same noise. Being older, they knew something was wrong. So quietly, my older sister wanted to check out what it was. She slowly snuck down to the stairs and peered into the front room, where she saw a figure who was standing by the tree messing with the gifts. My older sisters, being shocked, snuck back upstairs and grabbed us and rushed us into the bathroom to protect us. That's when one of my older sisters rang up 999, our version of 911, to get help. She was too afraid to go get my parents, thinking that the stranger downstairs would hear her. Only when she heard police did she go to wake up my parents. My dad ran downstairs to see police handcuffing the man. But it wasn't just any man. It was my neighbor, an odd neighbor, that had always looked at us with a weird expression. My dad was so angry at this, he pressed charges. I'm very thankful for my brave sister, and I'm glad my younger sister kept me from going downstairs that night. Otherwise, I probably wouldn't be here. Santa is in the basement. From Jessica M. Location unknown. This happened when I was 12. It was late December, Christmas time and my parents and my aunt were on a vacation to Hawaii, but my cousins Elijah, Castile, and Blake were at my house with me, all of us having a big sleepover. By 12 that night, everyone was asleep, except for me, Elijah, and Dean. Dean is my twin. We were watching the night shift on Netflix when Dean said he needed to go use the bathroom. I told him that the one across from mom and dad's bedroom was broken, so he'd have to use the one upstairs. He grumbled a bit, but said okay. Nobody really liked using the upstairs bathroom because it's next to the door that goes to the attic, and the attic is quite creepy. After he went to use the bathroom, Elijah then got up and made some popcorn. As the other two were now gone, I decided to get my laptop from the dining room. After I got my laptop, I looked over toward Elijah I saw him standing there, just staring out the window. I went over and asked him what was wrong. He said he saw somebody walking towards the basement door. He said that they had walked inside. I began to panic, but I didn't want to frighten everyone, so I just told him it was okay. 
I said I'd go get Dean, and I brought up that the door from the basement inside the house was locked, so he couldn't get further than the basement. There should be no way that anyone was getting inside. Elijah and I ran up the stairs to the bathroom and pounded on the door. Dean opened up and asked what was wrong. I explained to him what Elijah saw. Dean told us to just go into the bedroom with the other kids and lock the door, and that he would join us soon, or just stay in the bathroom. After grabbing a couple of flashlights, Elijah and I had a very bad and childish idea. Before going to lock ourselves in the bedroom, we were going to take a peek at who was in the basement. We were kids. I don't think we really grasped the danger of this situation. So we went to the top of the basement where the door was. Slowly, with the flashlights on, we opened the door and peered down to the bottom of the stairs. And there, we saw someone looking back at us. And I swear to God, he was wearing a Santa costume. We slammed the door, locked it back, and ran up the steps. We locked ourselves in the room with everyone else and prayed that the man could not break out of the basement. We could hear him pounding on the basement door. I don't know how the others were still asleep through this. We suddenly hear a breaking sound, and the next thing we know, we hear footsteps coming toward the bedroom door. So someone hops on the phone with our Uncle Drew. He said that he was at a long shift at the hospital nearby, and if he left right away, it would take him half an hour to be there. He said instead he was going to call Rick. About 10 minutes and dozens of bangs at the door later, we get a call from Uncle Rick, and he said he had just talked to Drew, and that he'd be there in moments. So he must have been speeding because they live half an hour away as well. In literal seconds after the call, we hear Uncle Rick pull up in the driveway. The sounds from outside the door had stopped, and I believe the man may have been spooked from someone pulling up in the driveway. So I look under the crack beneath the door, and I see that the hallway is now empty. Taking the opportunity, we all rush downstairs and into the driveway, piling into Uncle Rick's car. As we were pulling away, being taken back to Rick's and Drew's place, I found out that the guy, the stranger in the Santa suit, had not been spooked away, because he was now running up the driveway like a maniac. Of course, we outran him, and within half an hour, we were back at Rick and Drew's house, preparing to go to bed in his guest bedroom after an exhausting and terrifying night. Rick said he'd be working on getting a police report filed as soon as possible. If Uncle Rick hadn't come over, if someone didn't make it in time, I don't know what would have become of us because that basement door did not hold and that bedroom door wasn't going to hold for long either. I'm glad I'm still here in one piece but now my Christmases have been tinged. Christmas Time Tragedy Submitted to and read by Swamp Dweller from Cheyenne L. I've been dreading sharing this story as the memories, they're really hard to relive. My family and I were involved in a shooting it was December 20th, 1993, in Berwick, Maine, where these events happened. They lasted until about the 21st or 22nd. However, I was 14 when this happened, and my father was no longer in my family or my life. To give you an idea of the layout of where we lived, before you walk into our apartment, you have to go into a room with a staircase that leads up. Our door is the last one on the right when you're facing the front entrance. When you first enter our apartment, you will start in the living room, followed by the kitchen. To the left is the bathroom, and through a doorway past the kitchen is my brother's room. Through my brother's room and another doorway is my room, while in the back of my room to the left is the back exit out of the apartment itself. Now that I've got a setup out of the way, I'll explain the story itself. It was Christmas break, and it had been snowing rather heavily. we just finished having my brother's birthday party, and as such, there was my mom, three brothers, myself, and our neighbor's son. We'll call him Johnny. 
Johnny and I were the same age, went to the same school, and he had a crush on me. All the kids were in my brother's room working on a puzzle when I wanted to ask my mom a question. She was in the living room. I should also add there's a window above the kitchen sink which will be important later. And I headed in before asking my mom something. I soon noticed a sound as I walked by the kitchen but I ignored it. I soon head back to my brother's room when I hear the noise again. I turn to my mom and ask her if she heard the noise as well. She confirmed it and she had me being the dumb 14 year old I was at the time and I wanted to go see if it happened again, I walked to the window. I walked by and again we heard the noise. Curious, I asked my mom what she thought the sound was. She told me it was probably just kids playing around with firecrackers. She just asked me what I thought it was and I told her I honestly had no clue. I then shrugged and kept going towards my brother's room at which point I heard that firecracker sound several more times. I turned back and asked my mom if she still thought it was firecrackers as I thought it sounded more like a gun at this point. She told me whoever was making the noise was going too far and she'd go to her friends to use their phone to call the police as we did not have a phone at the time. I was instructed not to leave or open the door for anyone except for her, but I'd know it was her because she'd knock twice and give me a signal. It was at this point she locked the door behind her and headed to her friends. My brothers must have known something was wrong because when I saw them again they had a worried look on their faces. I instructed them and Johnny to crawl to the bathroom and once I grab my one year old brother I'll join them, locking the door behind me. I figured things would be safer this way as there were only two tiny windows that no adults could fit through in that room. We stayed quiet and listened outside. It had only been a minute when I heard several more popping sounds. My brothers began crying and I'll admit, although I kept a brave face, I was absolutely terrified on the inside. I couldn't shake the thought of my mom being out there and was worried that she could be shot or worse right now. Worried about my mother, I handed my little brother to Johnny and said I'd check on my mom. I peeked through the windows of the kitchen and didn't see my mom which led me to believe I might have overreacted about the entire situation. Just as I was about to calm down I heard knocking at the door which made me jump. Johnny gave me a look as though asking of what we should do. I wasn't sure what to do. The knocking continued and I know it wasn't my mom. Johnny came out and stood next to me as another knock came at the door. Johnny finally asked who it was, at which point a deep male voice said, It's me. Johnny, unsure of who it was, asking him who the hell was me, the voice said again, It's me, Kevin. I turned to Johnny and said it was okay as Kevin was my stepdad. Johnny opened the door at which point Kevin asked if we were hearing the popping sounds. We said yes before Kevin told us to go with him to their place until my mom got back. We agreed and just as I was about to leave I saw my mom's friend Bear out in the street. Assuming that meant things were okay, I told Johnny to go with my brothers and rushed out to meet Bear. I asked Bear if he had seen my mom at which point he said yeah, she's on the phone with the police right now. I hugged Bear before standing slightly to his left at which point I noticed he was eyeing a house near the garage. What happened next gave me nightmares. I heard the sound of a gun. Bear grabbed my right arm and then I heard another sound and blood splattered on me. Bear told me to run as he fell to the ground screaming in pain. He'd been shot in the left cheek. I, I ran and busted through Johnny's door, crying, shaking and hyperventilating. I'm asthmatic. As I fell to my knees crying, this was when I met Wendy who would become my best friend. She asked me who the hell I was before I started screaming about being her neighbor and Bear getting shot in the face. Wendy hung up the phone she was on and her parents came into the room. Everything after this is a bit hazy on the account of my being in shock and traumatized from witnessing someone get shot in front of me. Wendy took me upstairs to change clothes and was trying to say something to me, but I just couldn't hear her for some reason. Everything was like muffled. My mom showed up at the neighbors before bringing us home but I don't remember when or how. I remember my brother, whose birthday it was, throwing up in the toilet in our apartment. The paramedics were trying to get to us at one point, but they couldn't because the shooter was shooting at anything that moved at the time. 
I was rocking back and forth staring into a mirror, shocked when I noticed a man in the mirror. The man looked to be in his 40s, somewhat heavy set, messy hair down to his ears, brown eyes, and appeared unshaven. We were in the bathroom for hours. I'm not sure how many, but the police kept calling, which is how my mom found out the ambulance couldn't get to us. I also heard they searched Bear and reached him. He was still alive, but in critical condition. This calmed me somewhat, terrifying all of us. I was, I was just so afraid that he might not make it. Suddenly, the door burst open and creeped us all out. It turned out to be SWAT, thankfully. Although afraid, I began feeling safer knowing it was all finally going to be over. We eventually snuck to my bedroom before the gunman began firing again. The police kept us safe, again. We were pinned for what felt like hours. At some point, the sun came up. I had no concept of time at this point as I was very much in shock. Trauma makes everything feel like a dream. It's the best way I can describe it to anyone who's never been in this situation before where they're traumatized and there isn't anything you can truly do. It's actually a defense mechanism of the brain, I guess. It can lead to PTSD, among other things. My mind had checked out at this point. It only snapped again when I watched a tree shatter when a bullet went through it. Honestly, part of me didn't want to believe this, and part of me pondered on how many guns the gunman had. The family was scared, and I was, I was definitely scared as well. My mind just wasn't fully processing it at the moment. I held my one-year-old brother singing to him and reassuring him it'd be fine, and we wouldn't let anything happen to him. Eventually, my brother drifted off to sleep, and sometime after, I'm not sure how long, the police told us they would be moving us to Town Hall, which was close by our apartment. The cops informed us to stick close to the vehicles and them. They said to keep low and move when they did. After some time, it was finally time to move. The moment we all moved in unison with the police, the gunman opened fire again. I remember the police firing back and the sound of bullets whizzing by from the police and the guzman. I remember being terrified and numb all at once. At one point, we got behind some vehicles and as bullets ricocheted we heard one hit the tire and pop it. As we approached Town Hall, I saw news reporters and people looking afraid. I forgot about the blanket the police had put around me before leaving our home, and tripped over it in chaos. I didn't get up immediately and remember people freaking out, thinking I'd been shot. The truth was, I was embarrassed by tripping and I'd hit my head pretty hard on the fall. A police officer eventually picked me up and began running. We eventually were cornered by the media who was trying to talk to my mom and I, and it was a little overwhelming but I remember feeling some semblance of safety again. In time we made it to the paramedics and I remember someone of some importance reassuring us that we were safe now. It could have been the mayor, he was dressed sharply enough. Once we arrived at our SIP, shelter in place, they had gym mats out and after our pizza, some attempt at play and the eventual sudden downing of things, I crashed. My sleep wasn't uninterrupted as I woke up any time I heard gunfire, but once the gunfire lessened and eventually stopped, I felt an array of feelings and exhaustion overcome me. We were finally, truly safe. I cried myself back to sleep and a nightmare woke me up and eventually we went home again. There was a heaviness in the air when we returned to our apartment. We hadn't fully processed everything that we had went through yet. The apartment never felt the same after that day. I remember being irrationally pissed when I went back to my room. It was a mess, the door had been kicked off the hinges and never truly shut right after that, even when fixed. My curtains were destroyed and everything was trashed. I found out later that the police had used my room as a staging ground of sorts. Bear thankfully made a full recovery from his injuries. Well, the physical ones anyway. I found out years later that he was never the same after being shot. Then again, I'm still not the same today myself. I don't blame Bear one bit for being messed up. Remember the man in the mirror? I described him to Wendy, and she explained I'd given the description of the shooter to the finest details. I don't recall having seen the shooter at all, but perhaps maybe I did. The mime will do strange things to you while in shock. When the break was over and we went back to school, the kids kept asking us questions about what happened. 
We couldn't deal with it, and I went to the office, called my mom, and left. The school told us to take as long as we needed, and we took months off as a result. When the information eventually came out that it turned out that our neighbor across the way was the shooter, his name was Patrick Wood, he was ex-military and the police had thrown tear gas into his home, but he had not left. Later on, they realized he hadn't left because he had a gas mask on. Inside his home, they found tons of weapons and ammunition. He dug a tunnel out from his house to a shed where his weapons were, and he'd used that to restock and reload when he was completely out of ammunition. The man also had several medications strewn all over the place. During the time I was with Bayer, I heard a whirring sound on the first bullet. It turned out that it was the sound of a bullet narrowly missing my head. I'm lucky to be alive to share this story with you. Patrick was terminally ill with cancer and his wife left with their kids. I'd imagine that's why he did what he did. I pass no judgment on his wife. It isn't her fault she snapped. I believe she had good reasons for leaving with their kids. It's going to sound crazy, but please hear me out when I say I empathize with Patrick in a way. He'd lost everything, and placing myself in his shoes, while I probably wouldn't have done what he did, I do see things from his perspective. Some part of me feels if the guy wanted me dead, he wouldn't have missed me with the headshots. I don't think he actually wanted me dead, and I can only speculate it might have just been because he thought of his daughter, maybe. It's only speculation and we'll never know, as he was shot and now he's dead. Patrick was amazingly the only person to die during the shooting. I feel bad he died, and since the events of that day, I feel safe nowhere. Any loud popping or sudden sound send me into a panic. Sometimes I feel cold sweat or hyperventilating. I only leave my home when I have to. I'm suspicious of anyone I come across, and I'm always looking over my shoulder at people. My insomnia is a lot worse, and I'm an introvert since that day. All of this is a result of PTSD. I've had several years of therapy, but it's never completely solved the PTSD issue. It has helped me process things to a degree, but I'm still messed up and mentally broken as a result of my experiences. This is something you can't unsee. This is something you can't see on the outside either. It's internal, and I try to put on a brave face around people. I believe you can outwardly show fear to people as some people will immediately see you as prey. Thank you for letting me share this with you all. And thank you to anyone who listens to it. Please be safe out there. A huge thanks goes out to Swamp Dweller for adding that fifth story and topping off a very creepy video. Even in the year's most joyous day, Christmas, Horrors and tragedies can happen, so keep your eyes out and keep your family close, and have a very safe and Merry Christmas. Good night. If you enjoyed this episode, be sure to subscribe to Swamp Dweller with the link in the description for more scary stories. Leave us a like and a share, and a comment, of course. If you want to support this channel, you can share your stories with us at darknessprevails.org. Donate any amount at patreon.com slash darkness prevails or get some of my merch by clicking the shop button below if you're on YouTube or go to teespring.com slash stores slash darkness prevails. As usual, here are my five favorite early comments from the previous video about 10 creepy cryptid sightings. Dub Dog says cheese dip. Okay then. Well, now I want some Velveeta. Fear Star says, Ohio loves you, darkness, and I love Ohio. Thank you. And I hope I get to do some Ohio scary stories soon. Kane Sevenify says, Hail the darkness and Lord Krampus. Krampus and I are besties. I like it when he spanks me with his sticks. The Weirdo Project says, Officially hot cocoa time. I haven't had hot cocoa in way too long. I've just been drinking hot coffees but there's something about hot cocoa that just is right, especially during the winter time. And So Speaks Galactus says, I better have Krampus horror stories for Christmas. It's the one video I wait all year for. Uh-oh, I thought I'd have a Krampus story in this video, but I didn't. So you guys might have to wait till next year. Sorry about that. Well, that brings us to the end of this Darkness Prevails episode. 
but don't you worry, because more scary stories are coming soon, so stay tuned. Until next time, here are the credits to my patrons who continue to donate. Remember, stay safe out there and stay creepy, because this world is a strange one.